will seek your face. With all my heart, I will seek your face, oh God, my God. I'm longing for your holy place. I am longing for your holy place to see.
Most High Living God It's in the sanctuary Most High Living
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So, Lindsay, who we got on Skype now? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, welcome, Houston. Houston, we don't have a problem. We have Jesus. Amen. And Mary and Sharon, welcome. Praise God. And who else was there? Mike Gentry. Mike. Amen. All right. Well, let's get into the word a little bit here. I want to share from Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and um, I realize that these are scriptures that we're all very familiar with. <clears throat> but... Um, um, I think there's a, a progression here that speaks of, um, that speaks to us, that speaks to us. <clears throat> but there is a thought also that I want to just put in the background of your mind, and that is, who taught Paul these things that we're going to discuss? Who taught them to him? <clears throat> and of course, we always say, well, the Holy Spirit. Well, of course, you know. But uh, just quoting Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in, whom, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Who taught Paul these things? <clears throat> All right. Um, starting... Uh, with uh, verse 19, I want to begin to set forth a pattern that is here. Now, therefore, ye are, well, let me just read the whole thing. Now, <clears throat> therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom all the building fitly fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. All right, so first of all, if you'll notice in the scriptures there that he says in verse 19, <clears throat> you are no more strangers and foreigners, but first you are fellow citizens. And that's what I've got on the board up here in this list. Citizens, you are fellow citizens. You are citizens of the kingdom. You are saved and you are brought into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> All right? But then in that same verse, verse 19, it says, um, and of the household of God. <clears throat> okay, it's one thing to be a citizen of a kingdom. You know, to be in a kingdom, that can be a whole lot of people under a king, and they are in his kingdom. But then this next verse says, and of the household of God. Well, the household of God is in the family of God. It's not just a citizen of the kingdom. You are in the family of God. 
And I do like the, the little phrase of it, of the household of God. I think that becomes more and more significant as we move along. <clears throat> but certainly in the family of God. And so, and most of this stuff we know, but I'm, I'm, I'm setting it forth to share something that, uh, what I'm sharing right now is what I shared in Arizona when I was out there. <clears throat> and, um, but there was the last part, the big, the big punch, that I didn't share with them because I didn't feel the Lord said, go ahead and share that part. Um, but I'm gonna share it with you tonight. And I love it, I love the Lord, and I love the, the intr intricacies of how he weaves the word together and how he, how he is woven into that. <clears throat> and then in verse uh, 20, the A part of that, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So the prophets foretold of Jesus um, and they also foretold of what he would be like. And we can learn Christ from the prophets. We can learn maybe in a sense, and this will be hard for some people to understand or maybe even receive, maybe even in a sense we can learn more of the, from the prophets of what his nature is like than the gospels because in the gospels we get so caught up in what he does and we miss many of the things that, that build that are built into his nature and his way, his way. Um, so the prophets laid a foundation. <clears throat> and you remember, and I'm not gonna quote all those scriptures, but you know there's a lot of places where when Jesus rose from the dead, it says that he, for example, <clears throat> Luke 24, when he's walking along with the guys on the road to Emmaus, and he begins to open up the word of God as pertaining to him and goes through the prophets and all of that. <clears throat> um, there is a foundation that we can have laid in us in relationship to the prophets. And I will be dealing some, with some specifics here in a minute. Um, but the prophets laid a foundation for the house. They didn't just lay a foundation and that's it and that's, they laid a foundation for a house. And um, that, that scripture there in Ephesians 2 begins to develop that. It begins to show that. It begins to show where this was going. And then also um, something is, you know, something is built on that that foundation, and that is going to be a house. But it has to be seen in light of what these scriptures want to bring out, and in light of what the prophets wanted to bring out, and in light of what the apostles wanted to bring out. So let's talk about, <clears throat> first of all, let's talk about a, a prophet that you may not recognize as a prophet, or may not have considered this person as a prophet, <clears throat> but as we get into, um, as we get into the punchline of where I want to go, um, we will find that indeed this prophet laid a major part of the foundation. And his name was Moses. Moses was a prophet. <clears throat> so if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 7. Acts 7. <clears throat> and I probably should have told you to keep your place there in Ephesians, but it's not hard to find. <laughs> Acts 7, and we're going to look at verse uh, 37 and 38. <clears throat> Acts 7, 37 and 38. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. This is Moses speaking this. 
like unto me being a prophet. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. I'm reading from the King James. In the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in, in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living or lively oracles to give unto us. So <clears throat> Moses was not so much a prophet of words. Extremely prophetic what he was going to present that pointed to us, that pointed to the church, that pointed to what we would come into that was not a shadow. But he wasn't a prophet of words. He was the one who built the tabernacle the dwelling place of God, okay? So, and, and it mentions this here, and we'll see it here in another verse also in just a minute. Um, so, what, you know, this, this is easy stuff here. What is it that represented, was represented by the church in the wilderness? Well, it's us as his dwelling place. Right? Okay. Because, why? How? How do we see that? Well, most of us have heard, at least me shared, if not others, because God uh, delivered Israel out of Egypt, which we all are familiar with, <clears throat> but in the wilderness, he said, I don't want to just deliver you from up here. I want to dwell in your midst. I want to come down, and he'd never come down to dwell. He visited Abraham. He visited all the, all the people. But at this juncture, he said, he, he began to explain something that was in his heart, and that was to dwell among us, okay? So... So he's making that move. Nobody's thinking it up. He's making that move. And then he tells Moses, I want you to come up here and see what I want it to look like. Okay, my dwelling place. All right? So um, Acts uh, 7.44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. <clears throat> so there you have it. God spoke it. God drew Moses. God uh, said, build this tabernacle. And he prophetically spoke. He prophetically spoke of what God, Moses did, of what God would do in our time. Now, if we only read it as history, if we only see Moses as the lawgiver, then we're going to miss something very important because he was prophetically setting something forth. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Are we? Are we? Or are we just built on... <clears throat> on uh, what Jesus did in the Gospels and what scriptures that we have seen something in in relationship to uh, the, the New Testament, the epistles, or have we part of that foundation? Has it been built by the prophets that God said? And, you know, we're going to see several different examples of this as we go, that God said, this is a prophecy. This is not just about Israel. This is a meant to be about those that are coming, those that will be mine. Those that will be mine and those that will fulfill all that was in my heart when I said to Moses, make me a dwelling place. Make me, and it was called the church in the wilderness. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so another another prophet that maybe you don't 
recognized as a prophet. His name is David. David. Okay. So look in Acts 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. And verse 29 and 30. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he was that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Okay. So this says David knew that this was prophetic. In other words, to, him, to David, it wasn't just his life in his time and about him. It was about prophecy. It was about what was coming. It was about what God had in his heart. It was not about, um, it was not about uh, just God being there with David. Yes, God was there with David. But God swore something to David that related to us that it is possible that we never saw him as a prophet nor never heard anything from him as a prophet and were never built on a foundation that Moses and David got from the Lord in relationship to us, particularly in relationship to the things on the board. And might I say this? that are a progression. They are a progression. They are. They are a progression. <clears throat> All right. So let's go to Acts 7, and we'll talk a little more about David. Acts 7. Acts 7, verse uh, 45. <clears throat> and we'll read through 47 which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus. And the word Jesus here is really speaking of Joshua, but Joshua and Jesus, Je Joshua is the Hebrew for New Testament Jesus. It's speaking of uh, Joshua, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Okay? So David came up with this. This is different. Moses was, God said, I want to dwell there. Okay? So build, I want to dwell in your midst, in your midst, in your midst. Build me a place. But here's what it's going to look like. It's going to, it's going to come from here. It's not going to be man-made, and it's not going to be after man, and it's not going to be after man's concepts. The, the thing I'm telling you, Moses, this is a prophetic thing, and, and everything that's going on between us now in this relationship, it has to do with what's in my heart from above brought down into the earth and made a reality. And Moses, you're just a prophet to, to the real that I have in my heart. Okay. So I guess that kind of puts a little burden on us because we're the ones that are supposed to be, you know, supposed to be the fulfillment of that. <clears throat> so, so again, God intervened. God came down. God spoke to Moses and he, he described what he wanted. Okay. But David, but David, also being a prophet, it came into his heart. Completely different than divine intervention. Many of us are waiting for divine intervention. Okay? We're waiting for God to hit us with it. We're waiting for God to do something big. We're waiting for God to show it and God to be real and God to do all this. But that, that was, and I'll even say that was the earlier part of the progression up here, which we will get into more. 
That was the early part of the progression. But as it progresses, there's, it, there comes a time when God wants it to be in our heart for this, not just what we've heard, not just what we've seen, not just God, God sort of, you know, saying, Moses, hey, I want to dwell in your midst. Moses, hey, come up to the mount. Moses, hey, I will show you all this stuff. Moses, build it down there. Okay, and what does it say in Hebrews? That Moses was obedient, but it was compared to a son. Isn't that I mean, I think that's really significant. And I think that David represents not just an individual who had a heart after God, but prophetically represents what we, we're supposed to become. Amen. Does that sound crazy? No. That, that that's, that's really what God is saying in these scriptures and saying in Ephesians 2 without going through all this. But you notice, I mean... We're reading, we're actually reading in the New Testament. You did realize that. It's talking about the Old Testament, but we're reading in the New Testament to find all of this. Okay. So the Lord is waiting for something to awaken in us without him having to go, hey, wake up. Yeah. Waiting for something to come alive in us toward him, having found his heart. Now, if we haven't found his heart, it's not going to come alive until we do. If our goal and our angles and everything has to do with, <laughs> okay, no, has to do with, and I'm, when I point to this building and us here, I'm pointing to every building and every group that's in those buildings that's called a church. It ha this, this is not it. If our focus is here, then our heart is not on building what God wants in his heart. And so we probably aren't building according to pattern. And when I say we, this is, this is not directly toward you folks or you. It is directly a reality that if it's not at work in us, whether individually or corporately, Wherever that group is, it is we're, 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 we're more of the earth. And we already probably think we have it. You know, oh, yeah, this is it. Every church, I mean, I, I wish you could just go with my mind and see every church and every service and every kind of way that we think this is what God wanted. He wanted a church building people. <clears throat> but no, no, and the, and the beauty, the beauty of this progression and the beauty of what we're, we're getting into right now is that we're going to see exactly what's in his heart. We're going to see exactly. Is that the last trump? Are we leaving now? <clears throat> Whoopee. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, who, uh, verse 46, who found favor before God and desired, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for God, who found favor before God probably because of this desire. God's going, man, you, you're not thinking about building your kingdom because, you know, he did become a king. You're thinking about me and building me a place where I can dwell. Incredible. I mean, and, and more incredible when you realize that the scripture in the New Testament is declaring him to be a prophet and whatever's going on in him and what's in his heart and what got built is prophetic of where, it's supposed to, where we're supposed to be eventually, wherever we are in the, in the progression. Verse 47, but Solomon built him a house. But, isn't the word but usually used in a negative light? Okay. So David wanted to build God 
a dwelling place, a literal house, just like him having a house and a, and a dwelling place. He wanted to build that for God. Hmm. So Solomon built the house and David drew up the, the blueprints. So I wrote this, but, but once Solomon built it, it became known as, known as Solomon's temple. It is no longer just a habitation for God in our minds, but it became a religious edifice. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, no. Oh, no. How, you know, we, get, we can get sidetracked along the way. We can get off, we can, you know, be pointing toward God, and then somebody builds it and calls it after their name. And then starts arranging it however. You know, it was Solomon's temple that got burned and tore down, right? Anybody know that? You know, the one everybody's weeping over? They're not weeping. Some of them are not weeping over God's habitation. They're weeping over Solomon's temple is gone. Man, I'm telling you, this stuff is when you see the heart of the Lord in the progression, you start going, oh, no, oh, no. We got so close with David. All right. So I'm going to reread up here uh, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 again. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but, what, number one, citizens, I've got on the board, uh, with the saints, and of the household of God, household meaning the family of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, okay? So, um, so let's talk about the prophets. We looked at the scriptures in the New Testament that pointed to the prophets, and it didn't say any of the ones we would have jumped on. It was Moses and David, and they were building, they, they weren't, it wasn't their words. They weren't, uh, they weren't prophets of words, but of building something, bringing into existence something that was in the heart of God. All right, but it said the apostles and prophets, so let's talk about the apostles. Well. You know, you can't go far without going to Paul, right? So um, verse 28 says uh, that very thing I just read. Paul is an apostle, amen? All right? And ver the second part of that verse is Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Wait a minute. Jesus doesn't become the Savior not prophetically, not in the sense that we think, not right in these verses and what it's trying to communicate to us. Jesus begins as the first stone, the first stone, the anchor, the anchor for the foundation for the house, for the dwelling place of God, for the dwelling place of God. Okay. So what do we see in that? Okay. Okay. Let's line him up. Let's just, let's just put our Jesus right here in front of me. Let's let him appear. Okay, there's Savior. Okay, you're out of here. There's Healer. Okay, you're out of here. There's Deliverer. Okay, you're out of here. There's Blesser. Okay, you're out of here. There's all of these. Remember, we're talking about prophetic things that the apostles got hold of, and they start building on that foundation. Okay, does that make sense? You keep going through all the Jesuses, all the Jesuses, but when you hear the prophets, and you hear, not, and when I say hear them, I don't mean with them talking, I mean you hear what their prophetic work is, you see that Jesus is in relationship to the, to the thing being built. He is the foundation of the foundation. Can I say it like that? <laughs> And without him, it is just 
Solomon's temple. That's all it is. Okay? All right. So, uh, verse 21 says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. All right. So, here we see the progression. Here we see. Okay. Beginning with, if we go back to the first, verse 19, we see citizens, we're citizens of the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. We see we're in the family, the household of God. Now in verse 20, we just saw we are a building of God, okay? Um, being built, and we're, we are a building of God. And so let's just look on the board then citizen household building now i want you to notice that every one of these things has to do with habitation in the sense of either it is that or it's trying to get us to that the early stages are trying to get us to that all right so a building a building we're a building all right yes Right, right. All right, so a building. <clears throat> now, it's real easy for us to just read those, two, those verses, 19 through 22, all together and just say, well, he's making us a holy temple so that he can dwell, right? I mean, it's easy to do that. That's not what it's saying. It's showing a progression because verse 19 starts with the citizen, then of the household. Then it says he's building us or making us a building and I wrote, we are a building. We're a building God can use. We, what is a building? It's a place you store stuff. You can actually have a building and, and someone not live there. <laughs> when when uh, our home was being built in, in Crum, our little, little 11 square foot home, 1100 square foot home, we, um, we lived out in a mobile home on the other side of Denton and as they were building it we would drive out with our kids when they were little and we'd look at you know first the foundation then the boards and then and we'd look at and then we walked through when the the before the walls were going up and you know but the roof is on it and we go wow this looks like it's going to be big and then they put the wall started putting the walls there and we went wow this is going to be small <laughs> and, then, and uh, <coughs> but <coughs> we, we were seeing a foundation and a building going up, but we didn't live in it yet. And it is possible that God can use us and store his stuff in us and it not be him living there. And I think a whole lot of Christians are storage buildings of information, of ideas, of things that they're going to use for God. And they were, you can actually build that together until even your church is primarily about the stuff that you got in there except the Lord. All the plans, all of the, the, the ideas, all of the, the materials, whatever, all of the things that you can put in that building and still not have any desire to make this his habitation, his dwelling place. All right, so um, <clears throat> it says, notice the wording there. It says that we are growing, we're a building, but we're growing into being a temple. Anybody ever really noticed that before, that it's actually two separate things? It's the building, but praise God to be able to be, to, to not just be a storage building, or a place of his stuff, but to grow from that. And that's why I said this is all a progression. To grow from that and to grow into a temple. All right, so what's a temple? A place to meet God. It's a place to meet with God, okay? Um, now I'm gonna say a few little things that might, might mess you up here. Uh, a temple is a place to meet with God when we feel religious and God moves on us. It could be Solomon's temple. 
a religious edifice. You know, like God coming down from time to time in that edifice, in that tabernacle, in that temple. Isn't that what happened in Solomon's temple? God would come down from time to time and, and move and do stuff. And when that temple was built, minds really changed. It really became a religious edifice. I mean, because everything just went in that direction. All of a sudden, it's not really about just having a, a dwelling place for him, a habitation for him. It was a place where you'd go there and meet with God and you'd have religious services and things would, you know, you'd want God to do stuff and all this kind of stuff. And again, just like Solomon's, just like the, the thing that God, David never said, I wanted to build a temple. He said, I want to build a, a house for God. And I don't, I can't tell you to what degree this is because I know it's big in me. Just the thought of the temple and this, and this being a temple or whatever connotates that reality of religious whatever, worship, doings. It all moves over there. Well, you say, well, God's, a, you know, the head of a religion. Well, no, he's not. He's our father. He's our, Jesus is our life. Jesus isn't, you know, and the Holy Spirit dwells in. The Holy Spirit isn't trying to make us religious. Jesus didn't say that. Now, I'm, I'm going to go away. But he's going to come back and start building, building you um, so that you will so that you will join the religion, <laughs> you know. He said, he's going to speak of me. He's going to glorify me. He's going to build you, build me, build the Son into you. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal the Son in you. What, what, okay, what job did the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have before he created all this? What job? Factory worker, I don't know, what do you, what do you think, you know? <clears throat> well, it doesn't say, but we know that for sure the only thing that was there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? So it was a relationship. And it, but it wasn't just a relationship, it was a relationship in oneness. It wasn't a relationship in, um, let's do stuff, you know? So God starts with the Garden of Eden, puts some people, puts some stuff in there, some cows, and you know, all this, makes a tree of knowledge of good and evil, puts a tree of life, and says, do me a favor, just that one thing in here, just the, just, just the one thing, just that. Don't need it, that, okay? But over here, you know, everything else freely, and you can freely have of the tree of life, okay? So what do we do? Let's head straight for the thing he said you can't have. You know? And so, um, but what was, the, what was the purpose of that? The purpose of that is where, we call it a David's heart, but it's not David's heart in the sense that it was prophetic. It's supposed to be our heart. Amen? Amen? Because everything we've read points to that. Okay, so, um, verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together, so there's the building, for an habitat, but here is the final thing. Now, we're, we're growing into a temple, but he wants us builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, a habitation of God. We are supposed to be a habitation, a place where God dwells, not just where he meets. You know, if my house was uh, my habitation, but, but every room, was, you know, this room's for Sunday school and downstairs, we, this is where we have church and everything and all that kind of stuff. It wouldn't be much of a habitation as people came home and said, well, we're, we're going to be praying in the prayer room and we're gonna, we got to fix up the children's church and all this stuff. It's like, you know, it's, I'll, I'll say it like this. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe it's better to have the habitation separate from the temple. 
It's just a thought. I mean, you tell me. <laughs> so, well, I don't want to. I don't want to jump ahead here. Okay, so. <clears throat> So I wrote this, and the apostles such as Paul were given to explain Jesus beyond what the gospels gave of him as an example. The apostle Paul explains him as living in us as our life, right? Okay, so let's look a little more, uh, yes, a little more into Paul's explanation. <clears throat> um, so where did... Let's see, the, the title of this was, I see, I hope I find one. Who taught Paul these things in Ephesians 2? And, and really beyond that, but um, where did Paul get this concept? Where did he get this progression? Where did, he, where did he see that there was this thing of being in the kingdom and then people would just emphasize the kingdom? Oh, and there was this thing of being in the household and people just say, well, we just get saved. You can almost write denomination or certain denomination along this stuff. Uh, a building, just a, well, we've got a, you know, we're workers and we're going to build and we're going to do all this stuff for God. Okay? Uh, temple, religious edifice, religious concepts, habitation. Where did he, where did he get that? Where? From the prophets, From the prophets and the apostles. So, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to read this, which is just what I said, but I think I added a few extra things. I can't remember. As a citizen, we're saved and placed in the kingdom. As a member of his household, we're in the family. As a building, uh, oh, yes, I'm adding this, that he is working on us. Amen? This building, he is working on us. So, you literally can have a whole denomination on, well, he's working on us, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and then the temple, uh, Moses and the tabernacle, David in the temple, a place where, and I'll say it like this, religious Jesus dwells. Now, Jesus isn't religious. It's really us that's religious. But I'm saying it to maybe make our stomach go a little bit. You know, and well, I need to, I need to stick with this. And then finally, a habitation, a place where he can live. Okay, here it is: a place where he can live, not us. Galatians two twenty. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, not I, not us, not us. Christ lives where? In me. In me. All right. So, again, where did Paul get this progression from? Did, you, did anybody notice where we got most of the uh, quotes from? Book of Acts, chapter 7. A guy named Stephen. A guy named Stephen. You remember the story, don't you? Saul of Tarsus was standing there and heard everything he said. Have you ever read all of his sermon, Stephen's sermon, and gone, what is his point? I know I have. It's like, I, I can't figure this out. I know it's good because he's in the Bible. <laughs> but, but that's about the only reason why I know it's good. But what is his point? And I begin to the Spirit of God began to open my eyes, and I'll take you through the progression to show you that this indeed is where Paul got these things. All right? Um, so, um, what is the theme of Stephen's discourse? Okay, so follow the line. I'm going to just give you some scriptures. If you're in Acts 7, if you're not, turn there. I'm going to start with verse 49. But when I wrap it up, I'll go ahead and just give you the whole, the whole sermon, because it's all chapter 7, okay? Uh, but we're going to start with pieces so that you can see an order going on here. Verse 49, 
What is the place of my rest? What is the place of rest for him? You're going to build him a temple? You're going to build him that? No, no, and no. You're either going to be that. Well, what did the prophets show? Well, the prophets showed the coming of Jesus. And the prophets also showed that he was coming for a place to dwell in us. Not just in the midst of us, but in us. Okay, we've already looked at a bunch of those scriptures, all right? Um, so just a few verses down, Acts 7, 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Okay, so he, he has set forth and will continue to set forth this reality of a habitation, a place, a dwelling place for God. And he's saying to these guys, he came down here to get a dwelling place and you killed him. That's what he's saying. You, I mean, haven't you ever wondered why they gnashed on him with his teeth, with their teeth? I mean, you know, if you read the thing and you don't understand it, you go, gosh, those guys were pretty nasty gnashing on him. I mean, he just said, you know, unless you see, oh my God, he's saying, here's the eternal plan and you betrayed him when you should have been this. All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, verse 54, <clears throat> when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So basically what that verse is saying is they were no habitation of rest for him. Because he said, where is the place of my rest? So we can read that only as, um, you can't build nothing for me. Where is the place of my rest? Or you can say, I don't want buildings and stuff like that. But where is the place of my rest? Since you're supposed to be here. Amen? <clears throat> so, verse 55, next verse down. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, and I went, okay, there it is. What is, he's full of something. <laughs> he's full, he's a habitation. It's, he is full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I went, okay, this is starting to get interesting. And it's just, it's just the beginning here. <clears throat> looked, stead, uh, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So now he's looking up and he's seeing the pattern for himself. He's seeing the pattern that Moses saw. And he's seeing what was really in God's heart that he wanted to bring down. Okay. And he wanted, he wanted to bring it down in us. Okay, let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 57. <clears throat> then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. <clears throat> so this is, so he was there during the whole sermon. There's no more sermon left of Stephen. This is where Paul got the pattern, and I'm gonna, I'll still yet show you that. This is where Paul got it from Stephen. He was standing there and he was consenting to his death, but the Spirit of God was gonna fasten those things in him and he was gonna build a reality based upon it that he went, oh my God. That's still not the main point. Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So here in Stephen, we see one of the first stones of a habitation for the nature of the lamb. There it is. 
It's one of the first stones. He's saying the very same thing Jesus said at the cross. <clears throat> I wrote what God wanted all along. He quotes the same words of Christ crucified because his spirit is in him in this way. Okay, so Stephen represents, the, in, in that sense, the first stone that actually is going to let the lamb just live in him. Just live. Has nothing to do with religion. It just has to do with life and nature. It just has to do with us being out of the way. Because you know if that was you or me, we would have said, you know, you're dirty. This is wrong. You're, stop throwing rocks at me. Y'all you know, deserve this. You know, you, you know, and they do deserve it. But see, that just proves we're not a habitation for his spirit, for his nature, for him to just dwell. It's just a habitation, not religion, not about storing up the stuff to have a ministry here on the earth, not just being in the family, having the family spirit, not just being saved or a citizen of the kingdom. All right. That was the main punchline, but I want to go through a little thing for you here. Uh, and it's only five pages, so don't, don't worry about it. <clears throat> Actually, it's not. Um, what I did was I, um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't have as much time to do this as I wanted, so it could be, um, it could be um, opposed that this is, um, that where either the divisions come or maybe, Randy, you're just crazy. We're all just supposed to be happy Christians. Whatever, I, you know. <clears throat> but I have these divisions dividing up the, the book of Acts chapter 7. Okay. So uh, you might want to write this down so you can look at it later. And I am open to correction if you find anything different, okay? Um, <clears throat> Acts 7 verse 1 through 5, okay. Um, <clears throat> This deals with being saved and coming into the kingdom. All right, so what is the subject? The subject starts kind of at the beginning where all the people are going to come, not individuals, but through Abraham, okay? And so the, the thing that Stephen starts with is, is that Abraham was called of God out of this place into this place. The place he brought him to was the place God wanted to build his habitation. Okay? If you're saved, he didn't bring up building it yet. It's in God's heart. And in a sense, this realm that you're going into called Israel, or the, the you know, land of Canaan that becomes Israel, will be a kingdom. But the point is, I'm taking you out of this, and I'm putting you over here in this, and this is where I want you. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Verse 6 through 15 is the household and the family. All right. So um, it starts talking about um, uh, Abraham and Jacob, Jacob begetting the 12 patriarchs, uh, the, the expansion, the expansion, the family, the expansion, the family. You see it? It's, it's right there. It's, that's what it's talking about. Um, but, but also, um, okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to try to build on that right now. All right, verse 16 through 29 represents the building where he's working on this. <clears throat> so it talks about Abraham being buried and the people grew and multiplied. So Abraham was the one who was saved and then the people grew and multiplied. We became family. Um, and then Joseph, um, and then they mistreated him and also, but then in which time Moses was born. And so, and then he starts dealing with Moses and then Moses 
uh, to come and help Israel who were not, who were already God's people. It's not citizens, it's not being saved. It's I'm going to come there and I'm going to work on them. I'm going to work on them. A building. He's working on them. Um, okay, and then uh, verse 30 through 49, no, 50, um, it becomes a religious edifice, the temple, okay? So um, uh, the, the process starts. He appears to Moses, he brings them out, um, he takes them um, uh, through the wilderness, Mount Sinai, um, and of course all of these have little elements of God's not pleased with how it's going. <laughs> you know, um, uh, for example, verse uh, 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and he pointed that, so it's speaking of the temple, okay? It's, it's all moving toward um, out of just being a building, just being worked on, to coming into having the tabernacle, and um and it even mentions David and uh, the house that he wanted to build, not the, not the temple. All right, and then verse 51 through 60, which is the end, for last verse 60 in Acts 7, <clears throat> uh, the habitation. Jesus can live his life as a lamb in his stones that make up his building in his habitation. So we'll read, we'll read that. <clears throat> okay, um, Stephen sees that they have not, remember, he's the one quoting all this about David was a prophet, Moses was a prophet. He's the one saying all this. I, I didn't let you know that we were pretty much reading out of the same chapter. Okay? So that, that Stephen was the one who said, well, this is a prophet, and this was a prophet, and we were supposed to be built on that and everything else, but you left that, and he's, he's rebuking them all along the way because now when Jesus shows up, they kill him instead of welcome him, not I, but Christ. All right. <clears throat> Verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Okay, so... Now, you do see my ear, right? I've, I've had the flesh cut off a bit, just in case you didn't know. Uh, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Okay, so what is the Holy Ghost job? <laughs> it is to declare the heart and things that belong to Jesus, and they're not doing that. <clears throat> um, which of the prophets, do you see, this is it's built upon the apostles and prophets. Paul got this all and the order from Stephen's sermon. <laughs> Incredible. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which, which showed before of the coming of the just one. So, you know, they're talking about he's going to come and he's going to come for this. You know, he's not just coming to save us. Did you, maybe y'all didn't know that. Jesus did not just come to save us from hell. He came to build us into a habitation, and that habitation can be called, another phrase for it is, the wife of the Lamb. Where he lives, his mind rules, his heart fills. Y'all agree with this? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> and they have slain, slain which showed before the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, <clears throat> being full of something, he is a house, he is a habitat, he's full of something. Um, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So there it is. He's seeing 
whatever pattern it was in the mount that Moses saw and came down and built something that was supposedly that. You understand? Built something that was supposedly that, but this is not that. What Moses built was not that. It was a type and shadow. We, uh, here's where we point to find that. Okay. This is where it's all fulfilled. This is where Stephen is going. I mean, literally going. He's heading there fast. I'm going to be a habitation for the Lamb. Okay. Um, Look steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. Okay, so what are you claiming? You're saying, Stephen, you're saying we're wrong, we're wrong, we're wrong. Our fathers, our grandfathers, all the way back, wrong, wrong, wrong. And you're right. And now you're saying the heavens are open for you and you see God and you see this thing. I think we'll just kill you. Nobody else talks this crazy. As Abigail says, this is crazy talk. Nobody else Nobody else sees it like this. This can't be right because nobody else says, sees it like this. You know. But here's the, here's the kicker. To, to see it the way it really is may precipitate someone killing you out, cast you out, whatever. It may precipitate things like that. Could I say it probably will so that you can be proven as an, one, another living stone. Living, living. It's got the life in it. Yes. The life in it. And building it one by one by one. It lets his life, his nature, his lamb spirit fill it to the degree that I, Stephen's going, he, you didn't hear him going, this is not good. <laughs> you know, I mean, I could I remind you guys that, you know, I do miracles for the widows and I help feed them and oh, I've got all this good stuff working for him. He's going, this is probably what it's all about. This is the habitation. I am now a true habitation of God through the spirit rising. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. Really? Really? We're going to stop our ears? <laughs> wow. I'm shocked at that. I wouldn't imagine anyone would actually stop their ears to the truth as it is in Jesus. And I do like this. They ran upon him, thank God, at least with one accord. You know, remember that's what it says of waiting for the Holy Spirit. They were in one place in one accord and the Spirit came. Well, this is the one accord that God said, we need to come down when they're building this, this temple, this religious thing where we can reach God in the book of Genesis. Babel, the Tower of Babel. We need to stop this thing or they're going to be in one accord. Wrong accord. That's more of like a Honda uh, Civic, I think. Anyway. <clears throat> and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, verse 58, and cast him out of the city, okay, and stoned him. All right. So he's standing there within the city, and this all happens, and Paul's standing there going, get him, boys. This guy's messed up. God's dealing with Paul. God... Uh, God is, God is going to have his number. God is going to show him that the very thing that you denied, the very thing that you stood against, the very thing, the very thing that I stand for, that you let 
that and help because you were a Pharisee. And they said, well, we can do it because he, this is a, a religious guy that knows. I mean, he's got deep knowledge and he knows and he's going to school and da 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 da. God said, I'm going to put you through this and you're going to see that you have done everything against this, just like Stephen said. By how? By first showing himself and then revealing himself as who he is that Paul writes about Christ crucified. I'm determined not to know. Does this sound like a stone, one of the living stones? Put it? I am determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. And by the way, he died also as a result of, of this. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Okay, no wonder he changed his name. You know, the name Paul means small, don't you? He didn't get bigger, he got smaller. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 59, and they stoned Stephen. They stoned him while he's calling on God. Okay. Saying, Lord Jesus, destroy these people for all their wickedness they're doing to me. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I'm, cry I'm calling upon you while they're stoning me. This is not fair. Lord Jesus, there is, you know, the, there's no way that this should be happening to me. All of that is just a mound of dung. You should be thankful the Spirit of God can stop my tongue. Because you need to hear the real word that all that is. You need to know in God's eyes that's the exact opposite of what he's trying to build and that that stuff is exactly what he was pointing out. Exactly. It's exactly what he was pointing out. And he was being the exact opposite. Whatever, whatever the cost, I want to be just a habitation, just a dwelling place where you can live, not where we come worship you, where you can just live your nature, where you can just live and you don't have to share it with a roommate, me. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, and he didn't say all that stuff I just said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, this was, he wanted to make this loud and clear. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. All right, so <clears throat> when we're in that situation, one of the big things that we seem to keep missing is the prayer not to lay it to their charge. That's not just words that you do. You don't just say, don't lay this to their charge, but they're wrong and this is bad and evil and all of this and, and just full of venom and vinegar, as my grandmother used to say. <laughs> just full of stuff that pours out of our mouth continually after that is not just a failure, it's an abomination. It is it is, but you know, it's like, okay, well, Randy, that's why we don't let you preach. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but that, you know, this is why. Because you always say stuff like this. And I have a feeling you could be a really good preacher if you'd only say sweet stuff. Okay. Well, All I can say is, Father, lay it not to your charge. <laughs> really, I mean, really, and it's right. And to, to love and to say, hey, I received that. Hey, I received that too as a lamb, not, you know, not as an end of, not another roommate inside there going, this ain't right, I, didn't, I don't deserve that. Jesus doesn't receive it because he deserves it. He receives it because he's not us.
you see this, you see the great red dragon in the book of Revelation. He's trying to kill that seed. And all this junk comes out. Have you ever noticed the scripture? All this frogs and all this junk comes out of his mouth. All, all this stuff. And like a river trying to drown the seed. And God takes him away to a place where inside you're safe. See, he doesn't deliver us from everything. He doesn't. He doesn't want to deliver us from everything. He wants us to be his and his habitation. And he doesn't want to live with you. He does not want to live with you. Can you get that in your head? He doesn't want to be roommates. He doesn't want you in there. You interfere all the time. He wants his son to live in there. And he wanted, he, the father, wanted there to be a habitation for his son to be able to live down here. God came up with the idea and told Moses. Then David came up with the idea and said, we got to do this. We got to do this. I'm king. We're going to do this. We're going to do it. We are not going to stop. We're going to, we're going to press in. And, and they, you know, they could say, well, it's a lot of work to build, you know, this thing. Well, it's not supposed to be your job. The, the work isn't building the thing. The work is getting rid of the inhabitants. <laughs> You know, that's the hard part, you know. But it's not hard at all because the cross already did that. See, if we see the cross, then we go, hey, oh, my God, look at that. I'm dead with Christ. I, I died with him. I died in him. And you see that by revelation. You don't go, well, Dad, come. that's a great doctrine. I'm going to add that to my stuff. No, 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 no. You, you hang in there until it's branded into your being and you see that, you know, there's not another inhabitant in here. It is meant to be him. Lord, not my will. Let this mind be in you. When you start naming off the different things that run wild in us. All this stuff that he said, let this mind be in you. I mean, we need, we need the Holy Spirit to, to go, hey, don't think that. Let this mind be in you, you know. We need that working in all of these areas, you know. Uh, you're not just not supposed to think that. You're supposed to be crucified. And you're supposed to say, but Lord, I am crucified. I don't have to become crucified. You saw to it. You saw to it that I needed to be dead and you made sure of it. And you said you wanted this as your habitation where you could live the way you want to live. And I was hindering that on every front because I am on a front until Christ be formed in you, until Christ be formed in you. You know, I travail in what, can you hear Paul the Apostle who got this from Stephen? I travail in birth. I travail till Christ be formed in you. So Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for what was in your heart for your son, we thank you that somehow you were able to move that into David. But he was just a prophet in a prophecy. And however strong that worked in that man on that time was just a prophecy of what we're supposed to be. You identified one man and said, this is the one. This is the prophet I want them to listen to. Build me a house. Have it in your heart, not in your doctrine. 
get out of the concept of the temple and making it a religious commitment instead of just in your heart. Just in your, it's just in your heart that he would have that for him, for him. Father, let, let, let whatever of Randy came out tonight be removed and, and forgotten and wiped away so that they would have no remembrance of it. But what is definitely of you, Lord, don't let them just bypass it. Lord, I know that there are many here that would give anything to have that so built into them that it only came by life and there was no works and no fears and no striving, but they could just be like Stephen. And when, when the stones are coming, instead of putting up your hands to block it, he knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, this is my cry, listen to me. Father, lay not this to their charge. Father, do that in us. Let, let us become the thing that was prophesied all of those years from the beginning all the way through in this progression that we saw. That we, we take it serious and we press to you. Your, your heart, we press to you. Not pressed by striving, we press to your heart. And we press up close to you and we say, breathe, breathe into us. Breathe it into us. Let us hear your heartbeat. Let us feel it beating in you and say, that's what I want. I want that beating in me. I feel it. I can tell it's a different kind of beating. And I can tell it's a different kind of breath as I lay on you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Can you say it with me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that even in the way that you presented this to me, I sense you, Jesus, wooing your bride to become the wife of the Lamb, not just a bride anymore, not just, not just soaking, not just pretty, not just all of that, but to become the wife of the Lamb so that we are a true habitation. Oh, hallelujah. And, and when, when the angel came to John and said, have you seen the wife of the lamb? Where did you point him? You pointed to a habitation. You pointed to New Jerusalem, a habitation. And when, when we looked, when John looked on the inside, he didn't see a bunch of people. He saw a lamb enthroned in her, enthroned, and out of him and his throne flowed into her, and out of her flowed the river of life to the nations. Lord, let it not be teaching, let it not be doctrine, let us not use that to act like we know something or impress people. Let us, until we make it, until it's become a, the way that it is in us, then Lord, let us not glory in it to glorify ourselves. Thank you, Lord. And then, Lord, just, just that thing of, of pointing it out to Moses, but David just being in his heart and bringing it up himself. Since you said that is a prophecy of us, then I think we have every right to claim that in us too. I think we have every right. You're the one who said it was a prophecy of us. We have every right to claim that in us. And so, Lord, 
we're, we do it. We do it right now, not because we deserve it, not because we've done it all right, but because you said it was a prophecy of us. And it gives us hope. It brings us to a place to lift our eyes from anything that we were, are, or will be tomorrow. And we cleave to your prophetic word concerning us. And we say, yes, not David's heart, but the heart that you said was us and that he was a prophecy of that. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And we're going to hold on to that. Lord, if we can't hold on to anything else from what we've shared tonight, we saw it in the scriptures. We saw it in the New Testament where Stephen himself pointed to it and said, this is who we are. This is who we're prophetically going to become. And it's not the church in the wilderness. It's the church, your body. Amen. That is your body. That's how it's worded in Ephesians, I think it is. The church, which is your body. Hmm. Yes, we lift our eyes and we lift our hearts. Holy Spirit, we just say thank you for uh, making us a habitation of God through you, the Spirit, and making us that through the Spirit of Christ. Finish the order, finish the work, just like it was written in Acts 7, just like the chart on the board, the progression. Finish, finish it. Many of us are in different places along that progression. It does not matter to you, Holy Spirit. You are getting every one of us there. You are funneling us there. You are shuffling us there. And Jesus went before us and became the chief cornerstone of what he wanted in every stone. When he laid down his life, that's when he became that chief cornerstone. At his death, that spirit. And then you called us by Peter, lively stones, living stones. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we say yes, Lord. <laughs> mm. Amen. Could we just take a moment and maybe just pray for somebody else? Uh, just just go to somebody and just pray for them. Would you mind that if we if we cover and protect one another and bless and and uh, bring the Lord to one another? Then if you give, it shall be.